All right, so uh, I know that elementary kids are dismissed, right? Is that right? Yes, elementary kids are dismissed, and the youth is staying in this morning. So youth, I, am, I know how excited you are to be with us. We are excited equally to have you with us this morning. It's, don't worry, it'll all be over in a couple hours. No, that's just a joke. Just a small joke. Hey, uh, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Uh, as I said, if you're joining us on the stream this morning at, uh, as a miracle, uh, we have never experienced, we went through an entire year of virtually uh, tech problem free streaming, and then all of a sudden, for the last four weeks, as we have started into the book of Revelation, we've had different technical issues every single week. If I didn't know any better, I would think that somebody doesn't want the book of Revelation to be taught, and somebody does not want that to be broadcast. But here we are, uh, just promised a blessing for being in this book, and uh, I believe that the Lord is speaking through it, and is going to really speak through it to us. So let's pray and ask him to do uh, just that uh, this morning. So Father, we do thank you so much, Lord, as we did before, just for the privilege of being here, Lord, and even more so for the privilege of being able to open your word, Lord, and to study it for ourselves, Lord, to hold it in our hands, Lord, and to be ministered to by your spirit, Lord, as he teaches us and uh, illuminates the truths of your word to us, Lord. We pray that that would happen this morning. Lord, we do look forward with great expectation to what it is that you want to do in each of our hearts. Lord, as we're just open to those things that the Spirit would speak to us. <clears throat> so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. Uh, we commit this time to you and we ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, once again this week as we start out, Continuing to look at the Revelation, I think it's important that we remind ourselves once again just of those first five words of this book because this is supremely what? The re revelation of Jesus Christ. And I say that because here we are now getting into our fourth week in the Revelation and some of you may be getting a little bit antsy because we have yet to read about one single famine. We've yet to see one disaster or one continent sink into the sea. And so some of you might be wondering, you know, what in the world kind of a study of the apocalypse is this? And yet Jesus is speaking to his church. All of these red letters on the page. And the fact of the matter is that for us as the body of Christ, Again, these seven letters to these seven churches, just in terms of pure application, uh, I think they're really invaluable for us. Because as we've said before, in these seven letters to these seven churches, what we have is a revelation from Jesus of what really is important to Jesus in his church as well as the things that are unimportant to him, the things that he likes, the things that he doesn't like in his church. And so I think that these chapters are priceless. I think that we need to be savoring it, really taking it all in. So as I said, this week we're just gonna look at one more church. We're gonna be in Revelation chapter two, looking just at verses eight through 11, looking at kind of lessons from the church at Smyrna. And you remember last week we looked at the first of our seven churches, the church of Ephesus. It was a church which, like so many believers, on the outside, it looked super successful. Remember, they had labor and they had patience and they had perseverance. But you remember that Jesus saw them as a fallen church. They're the church who had left their first love for him. It wasn't that they didn't love him, remember, but it was simply that they didn't love him the way that they had once loved him. And so remember the encouragement that they received from Jesus was to go back, to go back and to remember and to repent of their condition and then to repeat those first works, to do again all of those wonderful things that they were doing when they first fell in love with him, to kind of rekindle that love that they had for him. So now, as we continue, we see that Jesus continues. He now turns his attention from Ephesus, and it says in verse 8, 
of Revelation chapter 2, he says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Now pause right there. Here we have this city of Smyrna. It's the second kind of in our arc of churches. It was another large, wealthy city, just about 35 miles north of Ephesus. Like Ephesus, it was a seaport city. It was a, a rich commercial center. But even more so than Ephesus, it was an outstandingly beautiful city. It was called the glory of Asia. And it was a city which had in its past been completely destroyed at one point in its history. And then it was rebuilt by Alexander the Great. And of course, sparing no expense, he made it a model in the ancient world of what a well-planned city should be. It had straight streets that ran all the way through the city, right, north to south and east to west. And the most famous of its streets was called the Golden Street. And the Golden Street, at the harbor end of the street, there was a temple to Sibylle, right, the, the Greek mother goddess. And then at the other end of the street, kind of at the inland side as the street rose up against a mountain, it, there stood the temple of Zeus, of course, the king of the gods. And then in between those two sort of pagan temples with their pagan altars, all along the length of that street, there were other temples with other altars to all the other pagan gods, to Apollos and to Aphrodite and to Scipolis and to Nemesis, right? So Christians here in Smyrna, they were surrounded by idolatry, surrounded by paganism, or we might even say it ran right through the center of their lives. See what I did there? It ran through the center, like the street, it ran right through the center of their lives. So again, Jesus, we see here that just like in the first letter, he directs his words, says to the angel, right? Literally the, the messenger or likely the, the pastor, right? The person who is delivering God's message to this body or speaking for God to the body. And so he writes this letter to the pastor or to the leader of the church. And it starts there in the continuing in verse eight with a reminder from Jesus. Verse eight says to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. So again, just like we saw he did with Ephesus and what we will see he will do with all of these seven letters, Jesus introduces himself with a specific kind of a self-description that he pulls right from John's vision of him that we saw in chapter one. In this case, saying that he's the first and the last, that he is he who was dead and came to life. And also, as we saw in Ephesus, he's reminding this church of something specific about himself, reminding thing, you know, of certain things about him that they either have forgotten, like we saw in the case of Ephesus, or in some cases, like this church, something that they were well aware of, but they needed to be encouraged again by, because of the difficulty maybe of a particular circumstance. And what we're gonna see, we're gonna see precisely why this reminder would be so important, that would be so impactful to this church. And we're gonna see it right now as we read next of Jesus' approval of this church. Look at verse nine. He says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So the church of Smyrna was a church that was suffering. They were suffering greatly. Right? All of this persecution against them and this blasphemy toward them had produced this poverty and a tremendous tribulation in their lives. Now the Greek word there for tribulation, it's an important one, and it's one that we've seen before. It's that word philipsis, you remember, and it means a pressure. It's that same word that was used to describe how they would crush grapes. 
It's that word that was used in ancient times, remember, for that interrogation technique as they were wanting to kind of produce a confession out of a criminal or torture someone. They would have that person lie down on their back and then they placed huge stones on top of a board on top of their chest and it would produce this great pressure, right? A great thalipsis that would literally push the breath out of them. And it would make it impossible for them to draw air back in because of the great pressure. And they would ultimately die under the weight of the pressure. And that's the word that Jesus uses here to talk about the kind of tribulation, the kind of pressure that they were under as Christians trying to live for the Lord in this environment in Smyrna. To be a Christian in Smyrna was to be under this constant crushing, killing kind of a pressure. It's that sort of can't catch your breath kind of pressure. And we see here that some of that crushing pressure came at the hands of the unbelieving Jews in that city. They were going around speaking evil of the Christians, right? Blaspheming them because of their faith in Jesus. And understand, this wasn't blasphemy against them by their idol-worshiping pagan neighbors. But this was blasphemy against them by those who claimed to know God, those who claimed to represent God. There was a very large Jewish population in Smyrna, and at that time they used all of their power to make things thoroughly miserable for the Christians there. It's these are the very same sorts of Jews that we've seen followed the Apostle Paul from city to city, right? Trying to destroy his testimony for Jesus. These are the very same kinds of Jews that we saw constantly confronting Jesus himself during his ministry. The very same Jews to whom he delivered such a scathing rebuke. Remember in John chapter 8, it says, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. But you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. That's why he says that they were a synagogue of Satan. Now let's be clear. Jesus was Jewish. Right? The apostles were what? Jewish. The entire early church by and large was what? Jewish. So Jesus is not against the Jewish people. What Jesus is against, and what he's talking about here in Smyrna, who he's talking to there in John's Gospel, are these certain kinds of Jews who thought that they had a relationship with God, they thought they were doing the work of God, and they thought they were representing God, but they weren't. Jesus is speaking to those Jews who were persecuting. They were attempting to destroy all attempts or all, you know, semblance of Christianity. Not only guilty of rejecting Jesus as Messiah for themselves, but they were making every effort to keep everyone else they could from accepting Jesus as Messiah for themselves. And notice this, that the one thing clearly that Jesus says is behind all of these, these attempts to destroy Christians and to destroy Christianity, what is it? It's the devil. So Satan is behind all persecution of believers, even if the source of it seems to be a righteous, religious-looking kind of a one. Right? Satan loves to come. Remember, Paul pointed out that Satan loves to transform himself into an angel of light. And then he sends his messengers to appear as if they also were angels of light, and yet all they're doing is the work of darkness itself, persecuting the church of Jesus. Now, in reality, here in Smyrna, this was only a part of what was producing this intense persecution that created this tribulation that the, the Smyrna Christians were undergoing because behind an even more powerful wave of persecutions against Christians that was beginning to really heat up at this time, behind that was the satanic spirit behind Rome itself 
as the religion of emperor worship or Caesar worship became a requirement throughout the empire. Now, this whole thing is a, a fascinating, I think an illuminating, kind of a cautionary tale right from the pages of history. And if I could try to quickly summarize it, it goes something like this. With the rise of Rome to power, right, as it started to conquer area after area and country after country and to turn them all into Roman provinces, not everyone was against this arrangement. Because what happened is that the power of Rome brought the peace of Rome, right? The Pax Romana, right? It brought safety and security and stability to trade and, and to travel and to commerce within all the confines of this vast and growing empire. And what it produced in many was a real sense of gratitude. It produced a sense of loyalty from a lot of these cities to the government and to the governing over them of Rome. Life under Rome wasn't easy, right? Your taxes were high, your freedoms might very well be restricted, but at least you knew what to expect. At least you knew you could go out and earn a living without pirates, you know, stealing all of your, your freight and stuff. Now through this, people started to look to the emperor as the provider of all of this good fortune, and they started to consider him to be an extension of one of the gods. Now, the early emperors realized that they, you know, they kind of resisted this early form of worship because they themselves realized that they were simply men. And yet you fast forward, and you see that as the empire continued to grow, Rome started really looking for something. What is there that we could use to unite all of these different diverse peoples and places and cultures, if we just had some unifying thing into the midst of it to help us keep all of this together. And ultimately they decided that the best way to do that was to unite people around the emperor, to take Caesar worship and move it from something that had been voluntary and now to make it mandatory, where all of the Roman Empire together would be forced to worship Caesar as a god together. And it was at this time, under the current emperor, at the time of this writing, remember Emperor Domitian, he would be the first to officially be deemed a god and to demand to be worshipped as a god. No longer was allegiance voluntary, now it was completely compulsory. And what happened is that once every year, every Roman citizen had to burn a pinch of incense on the altar to Caesar and then declare Caesar is Lord. And once you had done that each year, you got a little certificate of evidence that you had performed your religious duty. Right, because offering that incense and making that declaration was considered your act of worship toward him. Now, here was the great thing about the Romans. They weren't unreasonable at all. The Romans were not exclusive about this emperor worship because you could go into the Roman temple, offer your incense, declare the worship of Caesar, declare that he is Lord, and then ultimately go right out the door, go down the golden street to the next temple, to the temple of Apollos or Aphrodite or whatever god you wanted to worship, you could worship all of them if you wanted to. So Rome was very tolerant of your religious freedoms. Rome didn't say that you had to only worship them, just that you had to worship them first and foremost. And yet to refuse to offer this to Caesar would immediately brand you as someone who was disloyal to Rome, the government that had provided all of these wonderful things to you. And of course, for Christians, they simply couldn't do this. This was idolatry, right? It was the worship of something and someone who was not, is not God. It was a great compromise to their faith in Jesus. And so they simply would not do it. And as a result, historically, over the next 200 years, 
Christians became the object of crushing, crushing persecution by Rome because they were viewed as disloyal to the Roman Empire. Now, at this point, again, we're at about AD 95 or so, not every city in the empire was necessarily strict in their early enforcement of this decree to worship Caesar. But, you guessed it, the city and the citizens of Smyrna absolutely were. The city of Smyrna, they were some of the earliest adopter, adopters of Caesar worship. They prided themselves locally on this intense loyalty they had to Rome. They desired favor from Rome. So this city of Smyrna, like no other, was deeply committed both to idolatry generally, but more so to the worship specifically of the Roman emperor. And so to be a Christian in Smyrna meant automatic persecution. It meant automatic public censure. It was cancel culture right, at its finest. No one would deal with you on any level. Right? You were viewed as traitors to Rome. Pretty soon you were probably distanced by your family. You were fired from your job. You know, the stores wouldn't sell anything to you. Your home probably would have been pillaged, and that was not at all unusual in the early church, because who was going to protect you? Right? All These were the problems that the saints in Smyrna were facing daily. Now, we don't face these kinds of problems yet in this country, but it doesn't mean that we don't know that a very large part of the body of Christ in the rest of the world absolutely does face this exact same kind of thing right now as Christians. In Smyrna, it so impacted them practically, so much so that the word that Jesus uses there in the original language for the word poverty is a very specific one. There are several different Greek words for the word poverty, one of them means a person who has only what is necessary to survive. They have food and clothing, but they don't have anything extra. Now that is not the word that Jesus uses for poverty for this church. The word that Jesus uses here is a word that means abject poverty. It means absolute destitution. It's the poverty of someone who has nothing at all. The kind of poverty that affects your entire existence painfully and daily. It affects just your family's ability to even survive. There was hardly any other place you could go that would bring greater persecution upon you as a Christian than to be a Christian here in the city of Smyrna, where to go to church or to gather together on a Sunday was to take your very life into your hands. So we have to understand, that's the level of persecution against them. That's the kind of philipsis, right, that was upon them. It was no place for a weak Christian, that's for sure. And then you, what we see, though, just in this first word from Jesus, is it's into this situation, right? It's into this tribulation and into this suffering that Jesus simply says there in verse 9. What does he say? He says, I know. I know your works. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. And of course, I don't know all of the different problems that each of us are facing but, you know, have you ever been in a trial, you've been in the middle of a, a loss or a difficulty or whatever it might be, and you look at your current situation and you are simply at the point where you say, I am not going to survive this. I am not going to survive this thing that I'm in the middle of. And then you call right or you meet with someone that you know maybe someone that you respect someone that you trust just to talk with them about it and you sit with them and you begin to tell them all of what's going on in your lives and as you finally finish 
telling about it, right? As you lay out the misery and the pain and all of the circumstance of it. And then there's just that kind of a quiet sigh that they give. And they just look at you and they just say, I know. And when you know that they know, it is such an enormous comfort to you, isn't it? And when Jesus says to us in the middle of our difficulty, when he says, I know, he does know. He does. Jesus knows now because he knew tribulation. He knew pressure. He knew the crushing pressure as the crushing weight of the sins of the entire world were placed upon him. Right? As he cried out from the cross to his Father in heaven, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew crushing pressure. Jesus knows now because he knew blasphemy. Even as he hung there on that cross, sacrificing himself for us, and you remember he had to endure the taunting of the people that he was, the very people he was trying to save were taunting him. It says in Matthew 27 that those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from that cross. And of course he could have, but he didn't. He endured that blasphemy. Jesus knew poverty, of course, here on earth. Remember he said in, in Matthew 8, he said that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And I think that the Holy Spirit left it to Paul to really bring out the true depth of the poverty that Jesus was willing to endure to the Corinthians Paul says that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Can you imagine how incredibly rich in the glory of heaven Jesus was, and yet for us he became poor leaving all of that, that through his poverty, that we would be rich. Just as Jesus declares here that the church in Smyrna, they were rich. Now what that tells us is that it tells us that how heaven defines riches and how Jesus defines riches as compared to how the world defines riches, that they are two very, very different things two entirely different things. And we need this kind of adjustment in our perspective because even now within the church, even today, there are still those who continue to teach huge arenas full of desperate souls that if we only have enough faith that we'll never be sick, that we will always prosper materially, that we will be wealthy and that we'll be blessed financially and all of these other kinds of things, but that teaching is dead wrong. And I will say this, that to teach that doctrine is an affront to every member of the Church of Smyrna for the last 2,000 years. It's an affront to every member of the Church of Smyrna who is suffering like that in the world today, and there are millions of them. And we should be ashamed of ourselves that that kind of teaching still exists in the church. But that's exactly why we need these letters. We need these letters as Jesus speaks to his church so that we can keep our heads screwed on straight in the midst of this crazy culture that we live in. Because isn't it true that it's so often during those times of our most intense poverty, during those times of our most crushing tribulation, those are the times when we have realized 
just how incredibly rich we really are. I'm talking about Ephesians chapters one through three kinds of rich, where we can read over and over again how rich we really are in Christ Jesus. Rich because we've been adopted into his family and we've been forgiven and we've been redeemed, we've been bought out of slavery, that we now have the Holy Spirit within us, we have the confidence of heaven that's now before us. We are rich, rich, rich. Every single one of us this morning who knows the Lord, we are rich in a way that heaven itself declares and defines rich. That's the way that we're rich. James said, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But what an encouragement this would be for the church at Smyrna and for us to simply be reminded that even in the midst of this kind of affliction, right, though it's so easy at that point to think that God has forgotten, to be reminded that Jesus knows. And he says to these suffering Christians, yeah, I know your works, I know your tribulation, I know your poverty, I know the blasphemy that you are dealing with, right? He sees and he understands and he is right there with us. There is nothing in our entire pilgrimage that we could ever bring to him in prayer and that we can walk with him and talk with him about. There is nothing that we can bring to him that he will not completely understand experientially. And that is a wonderful counselor to talk to. Now, as we press on, which I know we need to press on, we, we know that what Jesus says to this church is important, and yet in this letter, it's also what he doesn't say to this church, I think that's equally important, because as we move now from his approval of them, what we see is that Jesus doesn't have a single word of accusation against them, none. Not a single word of rebuke, not a word of correction for these Christians in Smyrna. They are one of only two of the seven churches that Jesus has nothing negative to say to this church at all. They were so faithful in spite of their suffering. And how about that? We're through a whole other outline point just like that. Now, though he doesn't have an accusation against them, he continues now he does have an admonition to them. Look at the beginning of verse 10. He says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Now, what I think is interesting here is that Jesus gives them this exhortation to have courage instead of a promise that he would take away their tribulation. And instead, he actually says their tribulation is going to get worse. There's more coming. That, that, where it says 10 days there in verse 10, it is likely not limited to 10 literal days. Because in the Bible, the word days can also be used to refer to a time period. Right? In the Bible, both in the Old and the New Testaments, right? we see it in the writings of Ezekiel and uh, Ezekiel. That's like Isaiah and Ezekiel, right? The prophet Ezekiel, as well as Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, and the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John later, all of them talk about the day of the Lord. And it refers to that whole season of events that's going to take place at the end of history, which we will study about eventually in this book. And so the use of the word 10 days here, many Bible students believe it refers historically to what we saw were 10 great and specific kind of periods of persecution, 10 official edicts that were given under a string of Roman rulers that came during this time, starting back with Caesar Nero through these 10 
persecuting emperors, right? All the way right now to where we are with Diocletian and continued all the way up until AD 313. During this time when as many as six million Christians were martyred during the Roman government's satanically empowered attempt to completely wipe Christianity off the face of the earth. And because of this, Many see that the church of Smyrna historically represents for us that persecuted church of the second and third centuries. So AD 100 to 300. So this would be the church that followed the apostolic church and then continued on for the next couple of centuries. And we know historically that they faced tremendous increasing official persecution from the Roman government. And of course, though this specific and this kind of first period has passed historically, we know that the days of the martyrs is definitely not past. All over the world, Christians have continued, they will continue to face persecution. And I'm talking about persecution unto death kind of persecution especially in Asia, uh, in Eastern Europe, and all over the Muslim-controlled world, right? The religion of peace. We're talking about hard to read, hard to imagine accounts of religious intolerance and atrocities committed against the faithful, and yet we see that God gives the grace for those saints to remain faithful to him. Here, Jesus encourages all the saints at Smyrna to continue to be faithful, but not because they, would, they, they wouldn't suffer. In fact, again, he promises that their suffering is only going to get worse in the years to come. But what he does say is that in the face of all of that, they have no reason what? No reason to be afraid of any of the things that they're gonna suffer, right? We would totally understand it if Jesus came and said, hey, don't be afraid because you're not going to suffer because I'm gonna take away all that suffering in about a, you know, a half hour or so. But he doesn't say that. Instead, he tells them that many of them were about to be thrown into prison. Now understand, in those days, prison was not you know, incarceration for rehabilitation. Prison was the place where you waited until your death sentence could be carried out. It means that the devil is working hard to wipe out any Christian witness there in Smyrna in just the same way that he continues to work hard each and every day to wipe out every Christian witness in Mountain View, right? in the Bay Area, in any city or any village in the whole world that is precisely what he continues to be working to do. And one of his main methodologies in trying to destroy a Christian witness is suffering. Or to try and wipe out our Christian witness by attacking and overwhelming our faith as Christians when we are suffering. Especially as we're suffering because we're Christians. But what we can be encouraged by from the church at Smyrna is though here absolutely Satan did come out like a lion, right? Seeking to devour as Peter talks about. But the persecution actually only served to make the church stronger. God had a purpose in their suffering and so he allowed that suffering to continue. God uses suffering in our lives to purify us and to make us more like Jesus, right? To amplify and to intensify our witness of him because it was through their suffering that God would truly be able to display the true riches that this church in Smyrna had. Again, we compare this church to the other churches, no accusation spoken against it. And what's interesting is that if you check a modern map of Turkey, Smyrna, ancient Smyrna, is known today as Izmir. And interestingly, it is the only city, 
the only church in the only city among the seven churches in the seven cities that still survives today. It has survived through centuries of Roman and Muslim persecution. Like this church in Smyrna, we too can survive, right? We can endure, we can accept the trials and the suffering, the tribulation that God allows into our lives because we trust that he's going to use it for our benefit. And as we do this, there are promises, right? Look at what his assurance for them at the end of verse 10, going into verse 11. He says at the end of verse 10, he says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So Jesus reminds them, doesn't he, of this eternal reward that awaits the faithful. Right? That at the end of a faithful life lived toward the ward, that we are going to be rewarded with the crown of life. Now this type of a crown wasn't a, a kingly type of a crown. It's the Stephanos crown, right? It's that word for the crown that you would give as an award to an athlete who won. And I love that picture because it's like Jesus is looking at all of us saying, hey, you guys are my winners, right? You deserve an award. But in those days, they would give these champion athletes this crown of leaves, which of course would very soon just get brown and die. And yet we as Jesus champions, we receive the crown of life that's eternal. And what Jesus is saying to them is that though you know, their persecutors may indeed take their lives, they cannot touch the everlasting life that's awaiting you. They cannot touch the wonderful, unspeakable beauty. They cannot touch the incredible glory of heaven that is yours. He says, they may have stripped you of your riches. They have stripped you of your reputation. They has, they've blasphemed you. They've done all these other things to you and touched you in all of these physical ways, but they cannot touch the rich reward that awaits you in heaven. And that is still the truth for us today. Right, the enemy might kill the body, but here Jesus says that a faithful believer never has to fear the second death. Revelation chapter 20 is going to explain to us that that's death in the eternity in the lake of fire. Now you've probably heard it said that those born once die twice. Those born twice only die once. And if you've only been born physically, it means that you're going to die physically and then you're going to die spiritually for all of eternity. But if you're born physically and then you're reborn again spiritually into Jesus Christ, well then we will only experience one death and that's our physical death. And that's if we're not raptured before we're done this morning, which I, I know you're all praying for, right? Tomorrow would be fine. Either way, right, whether we're raptured or whether we die, we will never face that judgment. And what Jesus is doing here, pay attention to this, because what he's doing here is he's reminding them that there is something worse than being a persecuted Christian. And that is not to be a Christian at all. Yes, there is hardship that comes with being a Christian. There's even death that could come because you're a Christian. But we will never face the second death. We'll never face that eternal judgment for our sins. We will never even come close to that eternal lake of fire. And what he's saying to them and to us is there will come a day when our thankfulness for that fact alone is going to make us completely forget about any of the hardships that we had to endure here as Christians. Because do you know when a saint dies, we go straight into the uninterrupted and eternal glory of heaven. 
We have absolutely no sense of loss. There's no sense of regret. There is just the sheer glory of heaven and the presence eternally of our Savior Jesus. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians, he said that we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be what? To be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And so we think, you know, it's easy for Jesus to say, you know, be faithful unto death, but we can do that. We can do that, but only when we know death as our servant. When we know from Jesus' experience that death simply ushers us into the fullness of that glory. And so here to this persecuted church, that's why he reminds them of his own suffering and his death and his resurrection. Remember how he introduced himself in verse 8 as what? The first and the last, he who was dead and came back to life. He reminded them that he is the eternal one. He's the one who suffered death at the hands of his persecutors, but was then resurrected from the grave, right? He reminds them of his own victory and his authority over death, and he's not asking them to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. And he's not asking them to do anything for him that he hadn't already been willing to do for them and for us. He had been faithful to the will of God unto his own death, but death wouldn't have the final word. And so to these Christians who are facing the very real possibility of death, he says, look, if it comes to death for you, understand that death will not have the final say in your life any more than death had the final say in my life. Death is not the end of any story that God is involved in because he specializes in what? He specializes in resurrection. And think about this word of Jesus to this group of Christians at this moment, right in the middle of their terrible circumstance, right in the middle of this crushing thalipsis that they were undergoing, because so often it's when we're in the middle of a trial of this kind of depth that's when we start to doubt God, isn't it? That's when we can begin to wonder about his power and we wonder about his sovereignty. We wonder if he knows or if he cares or if he's really as powerful as he claims to be. We wonder if he really is in control of all of these things. And it's at those times, I think, when even the strongest of us, we can kind of start to wilt under that kind of pressure. You know, there, are, there are people who go through a crisis of faith because they don't believe that God can do something. And yet there's another quality of a crisis of faith, and that's to know what God can do, know how he could do it instantly and effortlessly, and yet to see that he's not doing it at this moment in this trial in my life. That's the kind of crisis of faith that both Elijah in the Old Testament and John the Baptist in the New Testament, they both experienced that kind of a crisis of faith. And that's why it's so important when we're in the middle of these kinds of trials, the kinds of trials like we, the church at Smyrna finds themselves, when we're in the middle of this kind of a deep, deep trial and we don't know what in the world is going on, Right? We have no revelation necessarily from heaven related to why this trial is happening in my life or why am I under this kind of pressure or this tribulation or this blasphemy or experiencing this kind of poverty. Why are all of these things happening? But it's at the time when we face these things that we don't know, what do we have to do? We have to fall back on the things that we do know. We have to fall back on the fact that we know that God loves me and that God is for me, that God is with me and that God is going to work all of these things together for good in my life, both presently and eternally, and that we know that there is a crown of life that's been promised 
for those who overcome. And it's been promised to us and it will be given to us by the Lord Jesus himself who is the ultimate overcomer. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because what? I have overcome the world. Now, as we close this morning, the name Smyrna actually means bitter, right? And from it, we get the word myrrh. And we remember myrrh, of course, because it was one of those spices that was presented to Jesus at his birth. Also remember Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus brought myrrh to prepare the body of Jesus after his death. It was used to embalm bodies. And so much so that this bitter herb myrrh kind of became synonymous with death. And so in a sense, just that, it's a fitting name, right? These Christians at Smyrna they were facing the very real possibility of their own death as a result of persecution. And yet, this very same picture, when we look at it from a, a, from a spiritual or from a heavenly perspective, it's even that much more appropriate because far from simply being a bitter herb that was associated with death, myrrh was also a beautiful perfume. And yet its fragrance was only released in its fullness when it was crushed. Just in the same way we're told that the, the full fragrance of the love of Jesus and of the nature of Jesus, it was revealed to us on the cross, right? As that crushing weight of our sins, right? He bore it all there on that cross. And in the same way, that the Christians here in Smyrna, they are being crushed by tribulation and by poverty and by blasphemy. But through all of this crushing, God is in essence communicating to them that there is a beautiful fragrance that's being released in their lives. And it's a sweet smelling fragrance, not only to him in heaven, but to others. And while they are experiencing the bitterness, the bitterness of suffering, that their faithful testimony was like this beautiful perfume of myrrh to God. And of course, the very same thing that is true of them, it's true of us as well. There is no question throughout the history of the church and for each of us individually as the church, never are we at our purest, never are we at our most fragrant to the Lord than when we are going through times of suffering, when he's sustaining us through those times of crushing. This is the way Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 2. He said, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph for Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Now we're going to celebrate uh, communion this morning. And what a fitting text what a fitting time to just take time to reflect on that sacrifice of Jesus, on what it means to us personally, you know, the redemption that he secured through the crushing that he endured on the cross. Um, hopefully you got a communion cup as you came in. If you didn't, just raise your hand and Rick has some extras and he will be happy to skip around the sanctuary and make sure that everyone has one. And Kissy and Bethany are going to lead us. And just go ahead and take some time to reflect and then go ahead and take the elements as you are ready individually and personally. And then when that's done, I think they have one last song to lead us in and then I will come up and, uh, and close us. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord, and how we thank you for your word, Lord, in those times when
Lord, when we feel so alone and we feel like we are under the crushing weight of our tribulation, Lord, or dealing with um, blasphemy, Lord, or, or stuck in, uh, in poverty, Father, we thank you for the great encouragement that your word gives us. Lord, we thank you for the fact, Lord Jesus, that you know that you know what it was like to endure all these things, Lord, because you did endure them. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would keep our eyes just firmly fixed upon you, Lord. We pray during this time as we reflect upon your great sacrifice, Lord, that you would give us fresh eyes, Lord, fresh eyes, Lord, of our hearts just to... Uh, to understand and to receive and to appreciate the way that you love us. And so we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We do it in Jesus' name. Amen.